So it's one o'clock, so I'm going to welcome everybody to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Susan Barrett. Yes, and um, I saw that Secretary Smith just put his hand up to say he'll be right back. So um, I think if I go through my items, that will give him enough time. Oh, there he is. He's back. So um, he is right after me. Um, so welcome, everybody, to our meeting today. I have a few announcements. Um, first, uh, for folks listening into today's meeting and for the public, we did have some um, additional items, uh, presentations that were not on the website um, right before this meeting, we posted them. And we also made a couple of edits to existing presentations. So I'll urge folks to um, go on our GMCB website and make sure that um, you are following along with the most up-to-date presentation. Um, also, as a reminder for presenters today, as you go through the slides, could you please announce which slide number you are on? That makes it much easier for those out in um, the virtual meeting to follow along with the presentation. And then last, I have a few scheduling announcements. Um, first, next, well, actually, first tonight at 5 p.m. is our primary care advisory group meeting that is open to the public. And um, folks can find that call-in information on our website, on our press release, and on our meeting um, calendar. In addition, um, starting on Monday, uh, we will be um, he conducting hearings for QHP rate review, Qualified Health Plan rate review. On Monday, we're going to hear from Blue Cross Blue Shield starting at 8 a.m. On Tuesday, we'll hear from MVP starting at 8 a.m. And then Tuesday evening, starting at 4.30, we will conduct a virtual public forum on um, the rate review, the rate uh, cases. So I urge folks to check out information on how to attend those meetings virtually online as well. And then last, uh, related to the QHP rates, um, we are accepting public comment for those rates. They can be found, access to how to submit public com comments can be found in a couple of ways. First, um, on, our rate, on our website under the rate review section, you can submit your public comment there. Also under our public comment section, that will lead you to where you can submit public comments. And we are accepting those until July 23rd at 11.59. And that is all I have to announce. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Oops, you're on mute, Kevin. Thank you, Susan. I'm gonna turn it back to you in a minute after the minutes, just so you can take attendance for the public record. Sure. So at this point, um, would someone like to make a motion on the minutes of Wednesday, July 8th? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, July 8th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And just for board members, um, just a couple housekeeping uh, uh, items. Remember that the, the little hand um, on your toolbar third one over from the right, um, fourth fourth one over from the right. Um, click on that if you have a question for any of the presentations today, and we will call on you. So with that, Susan, I'm gonna turn it back to you for attendance. Sure, um, I'm going to uh, read off folks who are not from the uh, Green Mountain Care Board staff. And um, also for your, a phone number, I'm gonna list the last four digits of your phone number and if you could just announce yourself. So I see Spencer Wepler is on the call and then I'm gonna call out some numbers here, um, starting with 8869. Toby Howe, MMR. Thank you, welcome. 0476. Lisa Fearon, Blue Cross of Vermont. Thank you. Seven, sorry, six three seven six. Mort Wasserman. Hi, Mort. Eight four six one. John Olson, Department of Health. Hey, John. Three seven one one. Becky Lewandowski, DRM. Hey, Becky. 
7520. It's Bob Hersey from NVRH. Welcome. 2796. Two seven nine six. Sorry, sorry, that's Carol Stone from Diva. Hi. Uh, one nine seven zero is that's our process. Yep. Three two one two. Three two one two. Yes. Hi, it's Kathy Mahoney from the General Advisory Committee. Hi. Thank you. Welcome. Eight, 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 eight. Uh, Joe Wooden from Copley. Welcome. And then I have, I see Abigail. I see Devin from Vaz. I see Howard Weiss Tisman from VPR. And I see Mike Fisher. And I oddly, do you want me to read out the other ones, Kevin, who are not on our organization? That or, or is that fine? No, Abigail can uh, write those yeah, down. Okay, because there's a, a, a top two. Okay, great. Okay, um, so with that, we're going to get started with our agenda. And the first item on the agenda is going to be a discussion with Secretary Mike Smith from AHS about the CRF funds. And um, welcome, Secretary Smith. It's a pleasure to have you back again. And we look forward to learning more about um, the criteria and process for the funding. So welcome. Thank well, thank you. Can you hear me? We can. This is amazing. We went, Just as I came on, we had a whole mess of technical difficulties as we were coming on. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. I wanted to talk about today, just to give you a heads up of some of the things that I, we announced yesterday at the governor's press conference. Uh, mainly, it's not the ag uh, grants, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. But it is the uh, healthcare stabilization uh, grant program, and you know throughout this um, COVID-19 emergency, and I, I just want to emphasize, we're not out of this yet. Um, th this is still, you know, a COVID-19 emergency. We've we've been focused on the financial stability of our entire healthcare system, uh, including provider, providers and array of social services, DAs, SAs, um, uh, dentists, all along the lines of, uh, of, so, of our healthcare system and social services. The reality is that preserving access to these essential services from uh, our standpoint is required. Um, We've got to buffer providers from the financial instability of business disruptions and increased costs resu resulting from COVID-19. It also means we've got to do our job of identifying the providers who are experiencing uh, fiscal distress and offer financial assistance for those organizations to prevent providers from being forced to close their businesses. And here at the agency, uh, we've talked about this before, but we have focused on that um, by providing response during this crisis uh, in terms of retainer programs, payments to hospitals, financial assistance to designated uh, and specialized service agencies, children integrated services, and um, private non-medical institutions and nursing homes. And in all, We've put out the door approximately $58 million so far in financial assistance uh, that was provided to Vermont's healthcare and human services providers. Uh, I, I mentioned a list of them last time. Um, we can provide that list uh, as well. However, um, as we started to look at this in a much more broader sense, we started seeing that more was needed. Um, just the um, uh, the Vermont, uh, we we looked at, you know, when we when we went out to providers and said, well, what do you need? We got a figure of three hundred and seventy-five million dollars. You know, uh, three the hospital system alone is talking about 
$300 million in business uh, disruption and increased expenses from the period March to uh, the end of this year. Uh, likewise, uh, independent medical practices are talking about 10 to $20 million uh, in, or in order to stay fiscally stable. And the Association of, uh, the Association of Adult Day Services is talking about $2.4 million a quarter just for fixed costs and personal expenses. So we went to the legislature, and Ina, if you um, if Ina or someone can start putting up after the overview slide, um, talk a little bit about what we did. We uh, we went to the legislature and um, and proposed what was called a health care stabilization program, with the objective of providing financial assistance to healthcare and human services. We originally asked um, for 275, uh, three, excuse me, 375 million dollars, 350 million dollars in this fund. Um, I think uh, through the leadership of Governor Scott and with the leadership of the House and the Senate, we came up with a sum of 275 million dollars of appropriations from the corona re, uh, coronavirus relief fund. Um, I will say this at the start, because I get asked if, if this is enough. This will never be enough. Uh, this virus has really caused disruption uh, throughout all industries and all sectors of the economy here in Vermont. Uh, and, and, and it won't be enough. But it is a lot of money, $275 million. And, and so the eligible providers, as we mentioned last time, is a quite a, a array of, of, of people. And uh, uh, I guess I'm not going to have my slide deck here, but that's fine. I'll just uh, continue uh, moving. Um, the eligible provider organizations um, you know, there are Vermont-based healthcare and human service provider organizations in uh, in uh, in operation on or before February 2020 will be eligible to receive these stabilization grants um, uh, through this program. Only billing providers are eligible to submit applications. Uh, a broad array of healthcare and human services providers are eligible for the program, uh, spanning from self-employed practitioners to uh, peer services uh, uh, providers to hospitals. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to talk uh, to talk about are, are the time frame for these grants. We're going to open up the grant uh, submission uh, that you could submit an application this Friday, uh, July 17th. Uh, it will run until uh, August 15th, uh, and uh, we will close that period. We're thinking of two tranches of uh, or two uh, application cycles. Uh, the first being what I just mentioned, July 17th to August 15th, the second being in October. And the reason we're doing that is that um, although, you know, there were great expenses from March 1st to June 15th, um, there are still some ongoing expenses that we wanted to capture uh, in the interim period from June 16th to September 30th. Now, we we know that one of the things that you have to do is spend these funds by the end of the year. So, you know, we can't have cycles go on forever, uh, but we wanted to try to capture as much reimbursement uh, and as much funding as we could in this. Now, if we get oversubscribed in the first period, there won't be a second uh, round. And uh, the, all applications will be reviewed after the period close. And this is a little bit different. A lot of the funding mechanisms that you've seen out there are first come, first serve. 
Um, this is not going to be a first come first serve. And we did it for a couple of, uh, of reasons. Uh, first of all, the funding determination will be based on total need in the application and we're going to review it um, on need basis. And secondly, what we wanted to do is make sure that that everybody had a shot at this. Um, just because you had a big accounting firm uh, uh, section in your particular um, uh, organization meant you probably could um, you probably could um, get the application done quicker uh, than a smaller organization. And so what we wanted to do is put make sure we had some equity and fairness in the system that a one person shop had the same sh shot at money as a as a six thousand person shop. And so we wanted to make sure that A, it was based upon need, and, and two, it was uh, everybody had a shot at the same amount of money. So unlike other uh, grant programs that you've seen recently, this is not first come, first serve. This is, um, uh, this, you have an application period, and then we will, um, we will move through the needs at uh, that point. Robin, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up until just now. Hold on just a second. Sorry, I'm not being able to unmute. Should I keep going? I, I didn't Sorry, hear. can you hear me? We yeah, can. I can. No. Okay, sorry. I don't know what was going on there, but the mute, I, every time I unmuted, it would remute. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I had a question for you about um, your current thinking on the turnaround time for the applications, which I imagine is difficult to judge without knowing what kind of volume you'll get. Um, as I'm sure uh, you know, we start our hospital budget process the following week after August 15th, our hearings start. Um, and just speaking for myself, I would be very interested in understanding which hospitals, assuming some hospitals get relief funds, um, got them and how much that would be in order for us to factor that into our decision making, particularly around commercial charge increases. Uh, we, but no, that's a very good question. We, uh, we're throwing a lot of resources to this to make sure that it's a quick turnaround time. We hope to have the money flowing out the door um, by September 1. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that will jive with the cycle. Um, and we were thinking about that as well uh, as we were putting the cycle together. So I, I'm, I'm, that is our thought process so far, Robin. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. And thank you for considering our process as well. That's helpful. Okay. Um, I just want to briefly say that um, it's um, it isn't you put your name on and you submit uh, in terms of an application. There is some process that is in this application in it, and we want to make and the reason we have this process in the organization. Plus, it's just prudent to have the process and uh, a process like this in the in in the application phase, but also we have federal requirements we have to abide by in terms of uh, making sure we have the documentation. So we're going to ask for organizational revenue in 2019 and 2020, uh, COVID-19 related expenses occurred, financial release received to date from either the federal, our federal partners, state or other resources, uh, organizational tax information to facilitate payment processing, and a documentation to uh, substantiate revenue expense and relief totals, including in the application, uh, W-9s, income statement, invoices, receipts. Um, we're trying to keep it as, as um, uncomplicated as possible, but it's not, um, it, it is gonna take some effort. We do encourage everybody to apply. We're going to have people that will help people through the application process. So we do uh, urge everyone to apply. And as always, there's some strings attached. 
to this. Um, one is the grant funds have to be expended by December 30th, 2020. That's a requirement of the federal funding. Um, grant funds will be used to cover uh, costs and lost revenues associated with um, uh, the COVID-19 disaster in accordance with the federal guidelines. Any resulting grant shall be funded with uh, uh, federal funds and subject to requirement of uh, the single audit. Um, and then uh, if applicable, uh, and, and this is a provision that I feel fairly strongly about, provider organizations will continue to participate in value-based payment initiatives beyond 2020. So um, those are sort of the strings that are attached, uh, the conditions, I, I guess I should not say strings attached, conditions to the grant um, as we move forward. Just for reference, you can see um, these are not new to you. I think uh, last time I was talking about this program, um, the, I talked about, I gave you some examples uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just about everybody that we could possibly think of that would qualify uh, for um, the $275 million. So I just wanted to make sure that you understood um, what we were doing, um, answer any questions, um, make sure you understood we, we did have in the back of our mind your budget cycle uh, and trying to make sure that we were aligning it up at the same time, trying to get money out the door as quick as possible in the, in, in the fairest way possible. And secondly, with the most, in making sure we could verify on a needs base basis, um, the money that was going out the door. So with that said, I'll, um, I'll take any questions. Questions from the board? Um, it's Maureen. I just had a question on when you talk about the financial relief to date uh, from federal, state, and other sources, I guess how will you validate that? And if it was an independent and potentially they were able to get unemployment or different things, I mean, or is there going to be a validation of what was received as well? Yeah, I, well, we know that we know where the 58 million went. So uh, we know that. We know what money came in for some of the hospital relief programs as well. Uh, and we'll look at, you know, whether they participated in PPP, those sort of programs as they, they go. I don't have the exhaustive list of what we'll be looking at, but we will be looking at all types of those programs as we, as, as, as we review their financials. Okay. And just another, I mean, uh, I think the concept of having the, the two time period sounded good because things are going to happen in the future that we don't know about. But you also talked about if it's oversubscribed in period one, then there really wouldn't be a second round. And I guess if we were placing odds on if we thought it would be, I think it, my, my gut is it will be oversubscribed in period one. But yeah. I don't know if you have any indication there. I, I mean, to be honest, we control the throttle. Yeah. Uh, on that, um, in terms of what we what goes on, if it's oversubscribed and there's a need, we're going to get the money out the door. Um, if 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 we see a need that is in the future, we may throttle back some money just to keep it in reserve for that future trance. Let me give you an example. Um, we provided relief up to with the designated agencies up until June. Um, what their expenses are going to be after June, we just don't know yet. But that's one of the things that we're thinking in the back of our head. No, thank you. And thank you very much for considering yeah, our process. And September 1, we'll, we'll fit in there. It'll be a little on the back end, but uh, you know, we'll have to like, hold out on writing everything up until we understand how this flows through. But thanks. Okay, Robin, I see your hand up. Yeah, thanks. I um, was curious, Mike, what you were thinking about in terms of value-based program. Were you sp speaking specifically of the Medicaid ACO program? Were, were you considering other ACO programs by other payers or 
How broad or narrow I, I, are you considering that? I, I, I was specifically thinking of the all payer model and and how and making sure that there is participation in the all payer model. Mr. Secretary, is there any type of uh, scoring guidelines, um, for example, X amount of points if you're doing this and Y amount of points if you're doing that? We are. We have developed those methodologies for earlier grant proposals in terms of scoring methodologies. Um, I am. Uh, I think those. What we're going to be using uh, is going to be a methodology that is that that's defensible. I don't. I'm trying to remember. The answer to your question is we haven't developed it yet for me to give you that answer, but it's not going to be um, based upon the alphabet or name, and there's going to be a, a process here. Will, will everyone be notified of whether they're uh, given a grant or not? Yes. What some is? Okay, yeah, good. They will be, they will be notified. Um, and also, um, I think uh, I would like to see, and I don't, I, I don't want to overpromise this, um, some preliminary indication at some point in in August, whether um, you know, once we get sort of the the preliminary scoring after the closing date, maybe some preliminary indication of where we're going with the grant application, just to give them some heads up, because not only do we sort of want to keep your deadline. We want to give them some information about where we're going as well. Yeah, the deadlines are tight. You know, you have to uh, make sure that these monies are expended by the uh, end of December. So um, are, are they going to have to certify that uh, they will have the receipts to you by a date certain? Yes. I mean, they're going to have to send us the receipts on the first tranche. We're going to have to see the receipts. Uh, they're going to have to send the receipts. I, I don't know the specifics of what we're going to be looking at, but um, certainly they're going to have to certify. They're going to have to attest to what what they're submitting. And this might be, you know, everybody. <laughs> Everybody gets surprised on, on um, it used to be Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays because they used to call it that I used to do policy from the podium. I may be doing policy right here from, uh, from, from the testimony. So, um, you know, I, but I think I'm pretty uh, accurate in what I'm saying in, in terms of that. Okay, any other questions from the board? Yes, I see a hand up. Tom. <clears throat> Hi, Michael, Mr. Secretary. Um, I'm just, what, is there, uh, so so these funds need to be used uh, for COVID-related expenses, but is there any look back where a an entity has covered an expense, but with reserves or scarce money and can supplant what the, the fact that they've covered it with this new grant program? Yeah. It, 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 Commissioner Pelham, I think that is, you're calling me Secretary Smith, I'll call you Commissioner Pelham. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, the, I think that is eligible for, uh, um, for funding. It, they covered the expense. Um, it's an expense that they had, or there was a business disruption because of it, and they covered the expense. Um, I think that's an eligible expense. And, and again, we have experts that are reviewing uh, what what we can and what we can't reimburse for those will be in the guidances that we send out with the you know with the webinars that we're pl planning on having with the various um, entities that want to apply. So I but if if you're asking me that in the way that you asked me, I, that's a covered expense. I. Kevin, I think you're on mute. Tom, your hand's still up. Did you have another question or? You're muted too, Tom. <laughs> I 
I'm going to take. First time I've ever hand. used the hand, so. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> Getting practice here. Yeah, we all are. It's a, you know, it was we just got used to Skype when we switched over to Teams. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to public comment. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, we'll take any public comment. And if you have a question for the secretary, please direct it through me. Any comments from the public? Hello, Kevin. This is Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. Hi, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. So um, it's not so much a question. It is just kind of a thought to share. And this might be on everyone's you know, radar. As, as, as I understood the conversation, is um, that the grants were intended to be used for cost and lost revenues for the appropriate periods listed of, of uh, March 1st through June 15th, and then June 16th through 9.30. And, and just noting that the hospital's fiscal year ends on 9.30, and when it comes to the matching principles on how we match this, we know revenue, um, it would be good to know, at least on the first tranche, it, um, uh, on the second tranche, probably no, but, you know, you know, for us to close our books for the audit purposes, you know, we really need to attempt to match up those time periods. And then also, um, uh, there was a reference earlier to the FY21 budget process, and, and I'm trying to understand if these funds were, if the grants are going to be granted, for impacts prior to 9.30 FY20, how would that carry over to the FY21 budget process? So I can answer that for you, Mark, because as you know, in the guidance, you were given the ability to um, ask for two different components, and one was a COVID-related component. And if you um, are receiving this type of help, it would have reduced um, really what your loss was because of COVID. And so um, that's why that's why it's uh, so important to us on our end, because um, the last thing we want is to um, grant a, a COVID piece to your rate and then find out that you've received uh, X millions of dollars that would have covered that. Okay. What if you don't ask for a COVID piece in your rate? Well, um, then it. Uh, you don't need to answer that, Kevin. That's just a. I'm. I'm just passing that thought out there. Okay. So don't yep. feel. I'm not asking you to make policy from the podium. Yep. But I, I'll gladly answer as one board member, Mark. <laughs> as long as it's reasonable and you can justify it, then you're okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any other public comment? Any other public comment? Well, Mr. Secretary, I think you're getting off rather easy today, um, but we really appreciate you coming in and uh, walking us through this. It's very helpful to us as we prepare to embark upon the uh, hospital budget process and trying to figure out how to uh, calculate uh, all the different money flows from uh, a myriad of different sources and making sure that um, we sustain our hospital system, but not on the backs uh, any more than necessary of Vermonters. So thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to um, Susan Barrett, who's going to walk us through an introduction on sustainability plans. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, the next item on our agenda is reboot of sustainable sustainability plans and update on financial health of hospitals. And I just wanted to lay this out for you in terms of um, uh, who's doing what. So we're first going to hear from Patrick Rooney, who's our Director of Health Systems Finances. Um, he's going to walk us through year-to-date data that we have, which is the end of May, um, and talk about the financial health of the hospitals um, reflected in that data at the end of May. 
but then I'll we'll transition to the reboot of the sustainability plans. And there are three staff members who've been working um, internally over the last um, uh, weeks and months. On, this, on the reboot of the plans. And we have uh, Patrick Rooney, who's the Director of Health Systems Finance. He has provided a, a financial look at the plans. Then we have Jeffrey Batista, who is the Chief of, um, he's a Data and Analytics Information Chief for us. And he's, uh, he's going to be working with us and has helped us on um, providing data that will, um, uh, that we will use uh, in looking at these plans and in populating these plans. And then last but not least, we have Elena Barabee, who is the Director of um, Value-Based Programs and ACO Regulation, and she will provide the health systems policy lens as it relates to these plans. Once Patrick has his update on the fi hospital financial health, we'll turn it over to Elena, who will um, run us through the slides on sustainability, but we'll have Patrick and Jeff also interjecting and available for any kind of comments or questions. And then I'll just close by um, just reminding folks, and Elena and the team will go through this when they talk about the reboot. Um, it was back in February of 2020, which sounds like, a, it feels like a lifetime ago, that we um, actually talked about sustainability plans. And after the COVID um, crisis, we put these obviously on hold, um, but we did work internally, um, staff level, to look at a way that we can reboot these and produce an updated framework that takes into consideration COVID, and everything the hospitals have been through and are um, quite frankly still going through. So, um, um, and then last I'll say, you know, this is a proposal. We'll have this out for um, public comment and we look forward to um, hearing uh, from the public and others on the framework. So I'll turn it over to you, Rick, to provide a financial update on the hospitals. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, board. Good afternoon, members of the public. Can everybody see my screen? I cannot. You cannot. Not yet. I think Abigail, if you can't get it up, maybe um, Abigail can work on getting it up on our screen. We may have to do that because I'm getting a message that desktop sharing is not supported on this yet. Huh, okay. Abigail, can you try to project? Great. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you, Abigail. <laughs> okay, so as Susan alluded to, we are going to review the year-to-date May 2020 financial performance of Vermont's hospital system um, as a prelude to the reboot of the sustainability plans. A lot is, has occurred in the last several months, which has impacted the way those sustainability plans have been uh, reconstructed and will be discussed today. So Abigail, if you could navigate to the second slide for the folks at home. We wanted to provide a brief overview of how we got here. It was not that long ago that um, COVID descended upon the state and it was March 7th where we, the state of Vermont announced its first presumptive case and less than a week later, the governor declared the state of emergency and as Secretary Smith discussed earlier, we are still very much involved in the COVID situation, even though Vermont has done a, a spectacular job of bending the curb and becoming a national leader in, in COVID mitigation. Um, that state of emergency was extended yesterday. So we're still very much involved in, in this situation as all of our hospitals are and um, their employees are well aware. Um, the next couple of bullet points are very important to the discussion we're gonna have today because <clears throat> within two weeks of that um, first presumptive case, the governor ordered suspension of all non-essential medical and electric procedures. That had a major impact on the net patient revenues of Vermont's hospitals. And it was a week later that the president signed into law the CARES Act totaling $2 trillion, a portion of which um, will be going, did go 
to um, healthcare providers around the country. And in April and May, the hospitals in Vermont um, began to receive some of those funds. In addition to that, Medicare and other payers provided uh, dollars for advanced claims that although incur debt offered cash flow relief should hospitals need it. So Abigail, please navigate to slide number three. So we'll come right out and show the situation that the hospitals have incurred in during this fiscal year. And as you can see, for the first several months, the system-wide operating margin varied. There were some months in which margins were good and some months that margins were bad. As February approached, we began to hear whispers of from hospitals that um, some of their <clears throat> appointments were being canceled voluntarily out of fear of the unknown that uh, COVID-19 was possibly even here in the state of Vermont, even though we didn't have a presumptive case. And we began to hear more and more from hospitals that some of those um, elective procedures and physicians appointments were being canceled. And that was um, looking back was kind of the early warning of what was to come as we looked at, at that in hindsight. And then in March, you can see collectively in that green column that the hospital system lost nearly $53 million. And <clears throat> that is with the voluntary cancellations going on in early March, but more so the cessation of those um, elective non-emergent procedures in the latter part of the month. There was a minor rebound in April and further recovery in May largely due to the infusion of those um, stimulus dollars to help offset some of the losses that the hospitals were incurring. And even in, in, as you move towards May, what we begin to see is the first initial stages of reopening our hospitals and revenue beginning to flow back in for providing patient care services. So just for a point of clarification, Patrick, uh, maybe you can explain that um, these numbers um, don't include all the losses because people put in, in place um, some of those um, relief dollars into their um, financial statements, but not all of them. So this isn't really a true picture either way of losses or of um, um, what what is left of those dollars. So in either that's, direction. That's correct. Context here is very, very important. Under normal circumstances, we'd be looking at a month and on a here and now basis. But because the situation as it relates to COVID is so fluid, that's difficult to do. And as we move through this, we'll discuss why some of these figures <clears throat> aren't realizing all of the stimulus monies that have been received by hospitals, but perhaps not realized in the system. And we'll, we'll move to that as we go through the presentation here very shortly. So Abigail, if you could navigate to slide four, please. This is a roll up of the year to date situation in our hospital system. And as you can see, those initial months beginning of the fiscal year, it was very, very mixed results. You had some months up, some months down. And then as February approaches, you begin to see this um, departure. And in March, the, the declines grow very, very rapidly. April, even though matters improved on a singular month basis, there was still almost a $24 million loss incurred in our hospitals, which drove that year-to-date figure to almost $87.4 million. And with a minor rebound in May, the situation currently is an operating margin loss of $77 million for all hospitals in the state of Vermont. Slide five, please. So we wanted to provide a kind of a before and after point of view here, because as I've stated and will state throughout this, perspective is very important. And when we look at fiscal year 20 budget and actuals, we had a budget to actual variance just, just about negative 1.6%. And as that compared to um, the same period prior year, budgets were, and NPR FPP was running about 2.8% compared to prior year. And that includes the um, charge increases that the board approved back in September. And as everybody knows, they try to contain those increases in NPR FBP to 3.5%. So the system was operating year to date um, within that um, threshold. So matters were moving along in the system and there wasn't um, a whole lot of discrepancy there or variation. 
And as we move forward on slide six, please, Abigail, we will see that the situation has changed dramatically. Um, the budget to actual variance is now negative 13.1%. And compared to last year, NPR FEP growth is down 9%. Um, budgets have been busted by COVID. And this is where our hospitals are finding what we call a revenue gap. And this is actual to budget. And you'll see that 1.796 was the year to date budgeted NPR FPP. The reality now is that it's at 1.561. It's almost a $235 million variance um, actual to budget year to date, May 2020. Slide seven, please. Moving into operating expenses and again, providing that um, fiscal year to date, February, kind of that pre COVID look. Um, budget to actual variances on operating expenses were around 1.8%, and actual to actual operating expenses running a little high at 6.2%. So <clears throat> we knew that was happening along the way. There's obviously UVM's um, operating expenses hold a greater weight than most of the rest of the system. So as we've said before, as goes UVM, so goes the system averages. And you'll see there, they were running about 9% over their prior year comparable as of February, um, which drove that system average into just north of 6%. Slide eight, please. And here we are now. Um, budget to actual is almost break even. It's almost directly on target. And actual to actual has come down almost 50%. And we've seen cost reduction efforts um, listed to us in monthly reporting from hospitals that range from uh, furloughing of staff, that's probably the most public um, cost reduction measure that's taken place throughout this. There's also been benefits freezes, uh, leadership pay cuts, capital project suspensions are a big part of this, money not being spent on investments that may or may not be um, recaptured in full, given the suspension that's had to take place, and also reduction in cost of supplies for elective procedures that the hospitals simply aren't purchasing because they weren't able to do those procedures. So that's really brought um, expenses growth more in line with, with budget and, and prior year actuality. Abigail, if you can navigate to slide nine, please. So here's another view of the busted budgets that I alluded to earlier. In the blue, you'll see the budget to actual um, May fiscal year 2020 um, NPR <clears throat> growth, if you can call it that, compared to the same period prior year. And there's only two hospitals on there where it's even close, and one would be Gifford and the other one would be Springfield. Um, the other is it is a large disparity um, in NPR, and that's creating that, that revenue gap that we spoke of earlier. Slide 10, please, Abigail. So one of the factors in this, and this is what Kevin was discussing earlier, these are um, from our, the folks at VAS, These this is the most recent information we have on stimulus funds to date. And those CARES Act funds are distributed in three tranches, the last being a rural stimulus relief package that Health and Human Services released in May to rural hospitals and hospitals with um, very high COVID admissions. And every hospital in the state received this rural relief funding with the exception of the University of Vermont Health Network. One, they are in what CMS considers a metropolitan statistical area. And two, their COVID admissions did not reach the threshold that Health and Human Services uh, had set forth for receipt of those funds. <clears throat> now, as Kevin discussed, it's important to understand that our hospitals have received $115.4 million. They haven't necessarily realized that on their income statement. They're using an accrual method um, by utilizing a what they call a deferred revenue account, which is a liability account. And what happens is when they received those funds, they parked them in that account. And then on a monthly basis, they will release a portion of them onto their income statement. We've had hospitals say, we're just getting back to break even. So we release whatever amount we need to cover the shortfall in operations. Some hospitals are use, utilizing it to get back to their budgeted levels um, to cover those shortfalls. So the ultimate result of gains or losses is not really gonna shake out until 
um, matters smooth out towards fiscal year end and maybe even beyond in some cases, depending on, on what occurs in the future. So that, that context is very important. And with the graph to the right on slide 10, we wanted to try to show hypothetically um, what that would look like had they realized those stimulus monies in the periods in which they were earned, much like they would with NPR. So you have prior year to date, May 2019, NPR of 1.713. Year to date, actual NPR through May for 2020 is 1.561. If they actually did realize all of those funds, it still would only get the system 1.676. So even with all of that money being infused, had they realized it as they do NPR, we'd still be 37-ish million dollars short of the same period prior year when it comes to NPR. Now that is just us trying to visualize for the folks here um, what the situation is in regard to um, the impact that cessation of electives have had in the reaction to COVID on our hospitals. <clears throat> Abigail, slide 11, please. So this is another view of the budget to actual variances and actual to actual changes for NPR and operating expenses. We've already covered it, but we put this in there to give folks a hospital by hospital view of how this pandemic has <clears throat> has come upon each hospital. There's a lot of similarities that hospitals had to react to. They all had to stop elective procedures. They all had to scrounge and scrape for um, increasingly expensive PPE, and they all had to prepare and alter floor plans, et cetera, to um, make their institutions safe for COVID and non-COVID patients, as well as their staff. Um, so everyone's had those similarities, yet the actual impact of COVID admissions in treating and caring for those patients and testing whatever has differed. So you will see um, variances at each hospital that differ based on their own specific set of circumstances as it relates to how they've had to deal with COVID. Slide 12, please. Finally, on the income statement side, um, here are the hospital by hospital operating and total margins. And they're, they are difficult to digest. They're on a, on a scale that is unprecedented uh, in our state and it shows the severity of COVID's impact and you know that actual impact as I was just alluding to does differ on a hospital by hospital basis and those cost reduction measure measures being employed the volume and diversity of elective procedures that were offered and the accounting methodology that we discuss is going to skew these numbers a bit and if you look on operating margin, you zoom in on Gifford. Gifford is showing a positive 1.876. Well, what Gifford was, was almost 1.876 in February. They had a very difficult month in March with the cessation of procedures. So when those monies began to arrive, they released, they took them and put them in that deferred account and they began to release them to cover that, that loss. So they took back their loss and every month since they've released just enough to break even. So it is possible that at the end of the year, they will come out at a level that's pre-COVID. Now there's a lot of variables there. Their volumes have to return to an acceptable rate and the money that they've received has to see them through by covering those losses. But that's why you'll see something like get that in there. And it really does depend on what shakes out at the end of the year. When you look at total margins, total margins um, have really declined. There's another 30 million dollars on top of the loss for operating margin. And COVID's financial impact is not segregated strictly to healthcare. A lot of the income streams that cover sometimes operational margin, margin losses on, in normal circumstances are derived from non-operating income, specifically from investment portfolios where securities are invested in global markets. We all know that in March, the global markets went into free fall as the world shut down and the investment portfolios, no matter how conservatively invested, were not going to escape that fact. And there has been some rebound in May and April, but not enough to recover what's been lost so far year to date on total margins. Abigail, slide 13, please. And now we're gonna move into the balance sheet side of things. Everything that rolls out of the income statements on a monthly basis rolls into <laughs> your balance sheet. And we're gonna specifically look at some of the current assets and current liabilities, because those are the sections of these balance sheets that we're seeing are most impacted by um, 
the fluctuation in finances that has occurred as it relate as it relates to COVID. We're not seeing a lot of long-term assets or as as we would call it, your um, <clears throat> your long-term assets, your your plant, your equipment, et cetera, because nobody is really making heavy investments, capital intensive investments right now. So we'll start off with the cash and the short-term investments. And if we look at fiscal year 20 May compared to fiscal year 19 May, we have about a 127% increase in cash and short-term investment balances. Um, so people may be at home going, wow, the hospitals are, are liquid right now. They're cash rich. I would not take that um, context with you because this is essentially a liquidity facade. We have going into those cash balances, the stimulus funds that have been provided to the hospitals, Medicare and other payer advances, potentially draws on lines of credit and other short-term borrowings like the SBA PPP loans that are sitting in there. Those, most of those will have offsetting debts or liabilities in current liabilities on the other side of the balance sheet that we'll talk about. In addition to that, these monies that have been given to them in the stimulus are, have to last. They have to last as long as they possibly can because volumes may or may not recover um, to the extent that hospitals are used to. There are safety protocols in place now and social distancing and whatever that hospitals have to abide by, which may slow the return of those volumes. There's also people's potential unwillingness to go back to hospitals still. And really hospitals can only catch up on volume as fast as their staffs can work. So there is a threshold there in, in, in staffing that can only take them so far. So those dollars have to go a long way. In addition to that, as the months go by, and this is where context matters, it could change drastically between this May report and a June or a July, because those Medicare and other payer advances are going to require reclamation and they're going to be clawed back to some extent. So these balances are going to come down as those are repaid and they're going to come down as those cash balances from the stimulus are used to offset losses. So you'll look at those days cash on hand all the way to the right and they have ballooned. Um, a lot of that is going to have to be repaid, and a lot of that is going to be used to cover those losses. And that's an important perspective to take away from this, because it's not a system as of right now that anyone could say is somehow benefiting um, outrageously from stimulus dollars coming in. That money has got to last. That's the important thing. Abigail, slide 14, please. So we'll move into accounts receivable balances. And due to the cessation of elective and non-emergent procedures, all hospitals have seen a reduction in revenues. And as those revenues decline, those revenue centers are suspended and those revenues decline, the AR that is being collected will drive down the balance in collaboration with the fact that those suspended revenue centers are not producing sufficient revenue to refill those accounts receivable balances. Inclusive of that, when we look at the days receivable, um, the columns on the left or the right where the days receivable is located, the average of 19 and 20 only comes out to a three-day differential. 2019, the average system um, days receivable was being collected at 39 days compared to 42 in fiscal year 20. So they were still collecting AR at a relative rate. However, <clears throat> the volume coming into there in revenues was not sufficient to replenish that. And in April, AR balances for the system dipped to 144 million. And at the end of April, that represented about five to six weeks um, during a period in which they were not able to earn on a large portion of, of their business. Um, and when you look at this, you'll see hospitals like Copley and Rotland and Southwestern where those days really came down. Part of that is the balances came down. And it looks like there was and amongst other hospitals here, there was a vigorous effort to collect as much as you can. You cannot pay your bills with accounts receivable balances. Cash is king. That is important. So you'll see those days <clears throat> coming down very quickly. The hospitals where you see increases all have something in common, and I'm not sure it correlates, but it is interesting, and that is the health network hospitals and Brattleboro, North Country, and Northwestern. They're either at or above where they were last year. Subsequently, all of those hospitals have, in the last uh, year and a half, implemented and integrated electronic healthcare records or financial software 
into their systems. And those often come with some slight hiccups and it may be the reason those balances are up, it may not. But it is interesting that of all those hospitals, those have all um, had software implementations in the last year. Everyone else is on, is on the decline. Uh, Abigail, next slide please. This is an area that doesn't often get much attention. These are the board designated assets. And these assets consist of items designated for a variety of purposes, some with and some without restriction. Um, much of them um, will be <clears throat> the investment securities that we spoke about earlier. And you can see from the colorful graph at the bottom there in the orange from February to March, there was a significant decline, about a $90 million decline in the system totals of those balances. Um, some of those investment portfolios were likely liquidated. Um, a portion of them were liquidated to make um, access to short-term cash early on when it was very unclear what any government help would look like. Um, but most of that is the devaluation in market activity. And you can see the rebound um, corresponds to the, the rebound in the markets. It is important to note that this is a year-to-date look. And at the end of last year, a couple of things happened. At the end of last fiscal year, Porter Hospital um, transferred the majority of theirs over to the UVM Health Network. And in December year end, UVM Health Network, I believe, had to make do on a pension obligation that was funded out of these board designated assets. So the value of them was naturally down. But the, the interesting part here is the February to March impact on those. And the less money there is available in here, a lot of capital improvements and new programs are funded out of the money that's churned off of this. So it's important that these balances remain somewhat relative to their historical areas because hospitals need to make those investments. Those are very, very important. When these take hits like they've taken, it puts a lot of that at risk. So <clears throat> we wanted to focus in on, on that as well as we move through our um, analysis here of the hospital. So Abigail, the next slide, please. All right, slide 16. Here we're getting into the current liabilities. And when we look at that year to year, year to date comparison, we'll see about a 78% increase or almost $300 million over where current liability balances were last year. And current liability balances like AR are susceptible to to the nature of timing and business operations. But with an increase like that, there's obviously something else going on. And there are several causes for this. Short-term debt incurred from the acceptance of, and perhaps not usage of, but acceptance of uh, Medicare advance claims and other payer advances, draws on lines of credit, other short-term borrowing, strategic and necessary delays in paying vendors, and the use of those deferred revenue accounts um, that will release and realize over, over several months, um, those liabilities into income. So <clears throat> when you look over at the days payable, they are ballooning. And again, oftentimes when things are as uncertain as they are, CFOs know this best, cash is king. There we are again. And they will delay paying bills. Oftentimes vendors will offer uh, discounts. We'll give you 10% off you pay within 30 days, 5% off you pay within 45 days, 3% off you pay within 60 days. Well, if the value of those savings is less important than holding on to the cash that you have to dole out to pay those bills, you're going to hang on to it. And we are seeing, along with the balances here, we're seeing those days payable rise. So there's a couple of things driving up those, those days payable days. Next slide, please, Abigail. Okay, fund balances to wrap up. <clears throat> um, we put a little note on the side to explain the fund balance. It is the equity position of the hospitals and it has been impacted by the fluctuation of financial activity that we have experienced year to date and most importantly in the last few months. And overall system wide, it is down about 3.9%. And it could have been a lot worse if it hadn't been for the cash infusions that were provided by the federal government via the CARES Act, because losses roll into here. And when losses roll into here, you're paying out your cash to cover those losses, which depletes your asset position, which depletes your equity position. You may also have to borrow money 
um, to meet those short-term obligations. So as that equity window shrinks, your financial position becomes more precarious. You always wanna be on the positive side of the equity situation. And if you're, if you're not, something is going on. So it's, it's okay to see things holding where they are right now. There is a lot of um, variables and unknowns ahead of us. And when looking back at March, and the fear that everyone had about where things may be in July, um, it's not too bad, all things considered. The situation with the $107 million total operating loss is not great, but there's been an infusion of liquid assets to offset those losses. And that is very important because that means the hospitals aren't utilizing their own resources to cover those, which is keeping this equity position relatively. And so that concludes the presentation. Um, again, in context and perspective of what we have here, there's a lot unknown in the future. Um, matters are gonna change month to month and further out. We are hearing from hospitals, the encouraging news that um, volumes are rebounding. And that has to do with Vermont's achievements of bending that curve and instilling confidence in its healthcare institutions. And that's very important. We hope, we hope that continues, but the resources at hand right now are not endless and hospitals are making do with what they have to offset those losses. So hopefully these volume rebounds um, continue throughout the summer and our hospitals can end up back where they were pre-COVID if matters continue as they are now. So, so I um, see that Marie has her hand raised. Yes, Maureen. Um, yes, my hand was raised. First time I used that feature. Um, <laughs> no, this is very helpful um, as far as, as going through what happened. Um, can you go back to slide 12? Is it possible to go back to the slide pieces? So I guess the first thing is um, something that Kevin touched on earlier, but one of the things that's going to be really important is to understand what each hospital is doing with the funds that they received and how they're recording them. So I think in the June request, um, and it may even be in the budget request, you know, just understanding um, how much money each hospital received and where they're categorizing it, if they've put it into income or if they're still holding it on the, the balance sheet and putting it in monthly and things like that. Um, but then, you know, because that then plays into this slide, um, I think what would be good to see on this slide in the future would be to compare it against um, both budget and private. Because this kind of takes into play both um, what happens with NPR and what's happening with expenses. Um, so that would be something to look, you know, because here where we're saying we have a system loss of 77 million on operating margin, but there obviously was a operating positive operating margin that we expected. Um, so I think it would be important to see that, you know, potentially in June. And I, I don't know if you have any numbers on that at this point, Patrick. We do not know. And uh, your to your prior point, we do have the question out to hospitals in June about um, accounting methodology and um, how much of the funds that they've received have they released and realized into the earnings statement. So we'll have an idea of what's left. And we can even explore that question again as we get closer to budget season, because as we said today, it's going to change quite a bit between now and then. So it's going to be important to have up-to-date information going into the budget cycle. Right, right. And then um, as on slide 16, when um, on the current liabilities, um, you know, there's 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 probably multiple things driving that. Right. One is going to be the loans that they received, and um, I think that was what about 100 and. 60 million or so, or 130 million. The, the other thing that would be good to see is how much payables, the change in payables is driving that because that would be reflected in their P&L, but not, not in their cash. And then understanding if there is a third component of additional borrowings. So um, I, I don't think we have, we, we know how much the stimulus loans are, um, but we don't necessarily know how much the fact that we have higher days payable is contributing here. Mm -hmm. 
So that may be something for June too, just to understand what additional debt people have taken on. Um, okay. Just to uh, tack on to what Maureen is saying too, Patrick, um, we're going to need the the uh, couple of hospitals that have received PPP funds or should receive PPP funds if the court so allows. Um, so for those approximately three institutions, we're going to need to know the percentage they believe is going to be totally forgiven. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, but this is good. A lot to unpack, obviously, but, you know, I, I think this was a, a good look that, you know, really shows the impact of what's happened, um, you know, through May. So thanks. Any other questions from the board? Not seeing any. I think we're going to continue on with this uh, presentation. And after all three have presented, then uh, we'll open it up to the public. So, Patrick, make sure you hang out. I will be here. So, okay. Elena, are you going next or is Jeff? Um, I believe I'm going next, and Patrick and Jeff will chime in as necessary, um, if that works. Um, and I am in the office. I just took off my mask. But I'm alone. It's the first time I'm here. Um, well, Janine is more than six feet, but anyway. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Let me know when you can see it. You can see it. We can see your name. Okay, so and just so everybody at home knows, the reason why you're there is that you need the solid internet connection when you're doing the presentation. Yeah, and you know, and if I would you had solid internet connection across the board, you wouldn't need to be there. <laughs> I wouldn't, I could be safely at home, you know. Um, that's okay, we'll just make do. Um, so as Susan mentioned, um, this has been uh, work that spans across uh, board staff. So I've been working closely with Patrick and Jeff to put this framework forward. Um, and so today, the structure of the conversation we're hoping to have is, you know, I think Patrick did a very thorough job discussing hospital financials. So we'll breeze through some of those slides um, that might look familiar. Uh, reiterate some of the national and local trends in hospital sustainability that, that we've been witnessing um, across the U.S. and here in Vermont. Uh, goals for the sustainability planning framework that um, we kind of started working from a number of months ago. Uh, we'll provide an update on the framework um, and then talk about uh, regulatory integration, um, you know, sustainability and the all-pair model, kind of that intersection or one of the many intersections um, of these two kind of concepts. Uh, we'll talk about next steps and then if, you know, um, should you at home wish to look into kind of what we use to build the framework, there's an appendix at the end. So now I'm on well, slide Before you go on to the next slide, uh, yep. Maureen, I see your hand is up. Is it just that you haven't taken it down from earlier? Yes, I don't see it up, but <laughs> I don't know who takes it down. I think you have to. Uh... There you go. Okay. Okay. Great. So I will continue. Um, so as you know, uh, Patrick mentioned earlier, um, uh, Vermont hospitals have seen um, operating losses collectively of 77 million for you know year to date as of May. Uh, total margin losses surpassing 107 million, um, and you know a variance to budget of 235 million. So. While hospitals have received, you know, 115 million of federal stimulus so far, um, it's it's hard to tell right now how much of that um, applies to these losses. And um, so, after the June year-to-date um, collection, we should have a better idea and be able to capture those details more precisely. Um, so, I mean, you're all aware of this slide, and I think this number keeps ticking up, which is why we're here today. So, since 2005, there have been 170 rural hospitals that have closed nationwide. Um, and 2019 demonstrated higher rates than any previous year. And, you know, 2020 is not over, but is, is certainly already keeping pace. Um, as of 2019, 25% uh, of rural hospitals um, were predicted to be at mid to high level of financial distress. 
them not a very pretty picture. Um, let's see. And then I just wanted to share this disturbing statistic with you um, in light of kind of what we are seeing um, for our hospitals is in, in a recent health affairs article published just uh, last month um, on the viability of U.S. rural hospitals. Um, it highlighted, it found that a median um, overall profit margin of 3.2 percent um, was the, you know, was the profit margin for hospitals that closed, um, and that was the margin in, their, in the previous year before their closing. Um, and they looked at, a, at approximately 1,000 hospitals over, you know, uh, 2011 to 2017 and um, found, looked at different characteristics that, that were associated with closure. But, you know, I, I, it's, it's still hard to tell with all the funding exactly where we are right now, but uh, the three point, negative 3.2% is not terribly far. So I think that kind of reiterates the, the concern that um, the board raised um, earlier last hospital budget uh, season, but is now even more pressing um, in our eyes. So, you know, post-COVID, we've, we've only seen this issue exacerbated. So the hospital, AHA, um, estimated $202.6 billion in losses for America's hospitals and health systems, $50.7 billion per month. Um, in April alone, hospital operating margins dropped to negative 29, which is a 282% decline relative to the same period in 2019. Um, and this just really reiterates the, the challenge with a fee-for-service system that is, is really insufficient um, to accommodate such severe swings in, in utilization. And this uh, slide should also look familiar. It, it describes and, and shows um, how expenses have continued to outpace um, revenue growth, um, which contributes to the declining margin that we're seeing in Vermont. Um, and this was as of 19, so I, I expect that 20 will look even, even worse as it comes to a close. Um, and I think Patrick actually had this pretty much exact slide that just demonstrates, you know, the system-wide operating margin of negative 77 million and total margins are only about, you know, negative um, 107.2 million. Um, and this is, is quite um, concerning. So, you know, this is not the first time that we've talked about hospital sustainability. This conversation really started before um, the onset of COVID. There were already many indicators suggesting that Vermont was on a path um, that, that needed to be considered. Um, you know, April 3rd of last year, the board held a panel on rural health care. Um, the legislature um, enacted Act 26 of 2019 to establish the Rural Health Services Task Force, which produced a report and presented it at the last legislative session on some of the findings there. Um, and then the board memorialized um, their concern or your concern um, in the 2020 hospital budget orders. So this requirement started with six of 14 hospitals um, to submit a sustainability plan. And as I mentioned, COVID has clearly only exacerbated this need. You know, there have been a number, um, you know, it's not just the board that's paying attention to this. The governor, certainly AHS, you know, Mike Smith's testimony earlier um, alludes to the same concerns um, that it, we really need to think about. Um, so the sustainability of our system. And, you know, I think the state is all hands on deck here to try to figure out um, how to how to best do this and, and ensure that Vermonters still have access to essential services. So just to um, you know, I think we presented this last time, but just want to reiterate, you know, this is really about engaging in a robust conversation on community access to essential services and the barriers to sustainability. So this is not a one and done exercise. I think this framework is just um, a, a proposal for what we would really like to see and consider and find a way to weave into the hospital budget process, which I think echoes some of Faz's initial comments about um, really combining the sustainability conversation into the hospital budget process. Um, you know, I think this framework, we, would, we really want to encourage hospital leadership boards and communities to work together to address these challenges and to incorporate them formally into hospital strategic plans over time. Um, I think this framework allows hospitals to identify hospital-led strategies to right-size hospital operations, as well as identify external barriers um, that could help them more aptly address their sustainability. So, you know, other stakeholders, policymakers, and regulatory bodies also have to come to the table. And, you know, like I said before, this is really an all-hands-on-deck approach, and I think this framework is, is information gathering to further that conversation. Um, and I think, you know, despite 
uh, just influencing the hospital budget process, we really need to, to enhance our regulatory integration work and leverage these insights um, into planning for a subsequent agreement. So how, how should we consider and should we add a fourth prong to our all-payer model goals that, that's about hospital? Should we? I think we should add a fourth prong on sustainability um, and how, how we consider that going forward. Um, so I will first start by highlighting at a high level, um, I'm on slide 11 for those of you who um, are following along with the slides in your hands. Um, so we'll review the proposed changes in response to COVID-19 at a high level and then go through the framework. Um, it, it's generally the same themes, but I think we've kind of clarified and gotten more detailed um, on some of the questions and metrics, um, taking into consideration feedback we've received from various audiences. And then, um, you know, I think, you know, what you'll see here is that we have expanded this framework and the approach to all hospitals. Um, this is, you know, in recognition of Oz's comments from March 11th, that we really have to consider the sustainability of all Vermont hospitals. I think this stands especially um, in light of the pandemic that, and as Patrick, as you can see from Patrick's presentation, that this is a really now is the time um, to think about this. Uh, a phased approach, we would like to, you know, find a way to limit the administrative burden on hospitals. We recognize this is a really big lift. But, you know, um, given the, the kind of critical nature of the questions that we're asking and the concern for the larger hospital system, we, we really feel strongly that this is the right time and, and, and the right level of detail, but recognize that we might have to work on, you know, when and how we collect these data. Um, so, you know, looking for feedback there. But uh, we've also incorporated specific questions and learning from the COVID-19 experience thus far um, to inform this framework. Um, there's, you know, certainly we can't predict what, will, what lies ahead, but to the extent that, you know, there have been delivery system changes taking place in like telehealth, et cetera, um, we, we would like, you know, that, that thought to be part of this work. Uh, so stage one, so this, you know, as I mentioned before, we're trying to break it up into four stages that would be done at separate points in time. And the first one is really focused on hospital financial health. Um, so in this first stage, the, the Green Mountain Care Board will provide a summary of each hospital's financial health um, based on regional and national benchmarks. Um, the information on the hospital's financial health will come through data submitted through the hospital budget process, claims data from BCARES and Medicare cost reporting data, which is new data to the board that we've actually acquired for this project um, to alleviate additional reporting um, done by the hospitals. Um, and then through these metrics, um, for those that are classified as vulnerable or highly vulnerable on a certain benchmark, we ask the hospital to provide commentary. Um, so to outline the specific action steps to be taken to bring them into the adequate zone or to get them out of the vulnerable or highly vulnerable classification, um, the time that would be needed to achieve that milestone, and then potential obstacles to success and strategies to overcome those obstacles. So, you know, it's kind of like a work plan on, on a metric level and just, uh, again, to further the conversation. Stage two, um, so we'll talk about timeline later and can that's certainly something to discuss, but stage two, um, would kind of bring the conversation to focus on essential services. And we rely on a definition taken from the American Hospital Association's Task Force on Ensuring Access to Vulnerable Communities. Um, and this includes primary care, prenatal care, home care, dentistry, psychiatric and substance abuse services, emergency and observation services, diagnostic services, transportation, and a robust referral system, and transfer agreements for specialty services. So. Um, you know, we want to leverage existing work um, and and use definitions um, that are already kind of industry standards, and this is one of those areas. Um, so, as it pertains to these essential services, uh, we would ask hospitals to comment on each uh, service line, our community needs for that service. It's supposed to say not met, partially met, or fully met. Um, which entities deliver these essential services? Uh, so is it at the hospital, the FQHC, your designated agency, independent providers, et cetera, which it might look very different um, depending on what community you're in. And then um, we would ask that you uh, provide some financial metrics 
for those service lines. So contribution margin or to total margin, uh, we're just looking for a positive or a negative here. It doesn't have to be a dollar amount. Um, and then estimate the following um, average price ratio, charge markup, average Medicaid to Medicare reimbursement ratio, payer mix, and percent contribution to NPR. Um, and those are defined um, more in a more detailed fashion in the framework, but I'm happy to talk about that later if there are any questions. Um, so ensuring the provision of essential services, hospitals will also be asked to answer the following questions. Um, so what percentage of NPR does that um, essential service line contribute to? Uh, and then for the essential service, what are the obstacles to sustainability to delivering those services uh, fully in your community? Um, and then what are the obstacles that can be undertaken by the hospital and those that require, you know, um, involvement by other stakeholders, regulatory or policy bodies. So recognizing that this is not all on the hospital's shoulders. So the sustainability of other services, again, you know, I think um, this is outside of those that are determined to be, not determined to be essential, but um, defined as essential services by the AHA, um, you know, I think we need to think about the value-based environment to which our state um, and much of the country is moving towards um, and CMS is moving towards. And um, how do we think about sustainability in the community's continued access to essential services? Um, you know, and, and how do we think about these other services that hospitals are, are also pursuing? Um, and can the hospital, hospital deliver these services at a high quality and low cost? Um, are there, you know, where volume has been correlated with quality for surgical procedures, for example, is the volume sufficient to constantly, consistently deliver quality of care? And um, is the delivery of these services efficient as we consider capacity and utilization? And then again, similar to the previous stage, um, hospitals will be asked to um, comment on the financial metrics um, or to provide the financial metrics, sorry, on the particular service line. Again, contribution margin and total margin are simply positive or negative. Um, and then we would look to have estimates for the following uh, financial metrics the same uh, series of metrics as before. And then in addition, you know, for these other service lines, what's the di distance to the nearest alternative provider? Uh, is there service line growth potential? Uh, does this service line support an essential service and how? Um, and is this service line would be included in an optimal service line in a value-based environment? So I think that's something we would like to know. And then does uh, CMS require this for hospital designation? Uh, so hospitals will ask for for those other services. Um, hospitals will be asked to look at capacity and procedural volume for sur surgical procedures only. Um, in terms of capacity, uh, we're looking for a monthly minimum, maximum, and average of staff bed occupancy rate, um, ED visits per day, and number of births if there is a birthing center present. Uh, for procedural volume, um, listing any surgical procedure and its volume um, if it's less than 25 times per year per physician or fewer than 100 times per year by the hospital. And these thresholds um, are kind of taken from the literature. Um, and then there are a series of uh, follow-on questions to understand, um, you know, more nuanced and hospital-specific information um, delivery of these other services. Has the hospital forecasted the demographic changes um, that are expected, and what does this mean for uh, their strategic planning and utilization expectations? Um, associated with essential services and other services. How does the hospital anticipate these demographic challenges will impact workforce, um, you know, associated with current and future Vermonters, traveling nurses, contracted labor. Um, and then for service lines of negative contribution or total margin, um, you know, how, you know, is there a documented community need for this service? Um, in addition, um, for services with charge markups greater than 150%, uh, we're looking to describe strategies to bring down the cost of delivering those services to commercial patients. Uh, for procedures identified in, in Table 4 is that um, capacity, um, sorry, procedural volume, so that's for surgical procedures only, where hospital volumes lie below 50% um, and bo or below 25. Uh, please assess whether the surgical volumes are sufficient to maintain low-cost, high-quality outcomes for patients. Um, can the hospital deliver each of these services 
listed in Table 3. So that's about capacity in a high-quality, cost-effective, and sustainable manner. Um, if not, what steps can the hospital take um, to optimize service line delivery? And then, you know, thinking about whether or not services could be delivered elsewhere if, it's, if it looks like it is problematic. Um, so describe what an optimized service line looks like for the hospital and assume there is a scaled up value-based payment model focused on primary and prevention and population health um, where hospitals are held for accountable for cost and quality. So, you know, while we're still in transition to a truly fully um, implemented value-based model, um, it's never too soon to continue planning um, on a local level. Um, and then what steps will the hospital take to ensure that the patients have access um, to um, divested services through referral transportation options. Um, we don't want to, you know, eliminate services altogether, but we want to be thoughtful about how they are delivered. Um, so has that been a consideration? And then will the optimized service line strategy in response to eight impact the hospital's ability to respond to a public health emergency? So, you know, I think we recognize that um, with COVID, we didn't have a lot of slack in the system. So there is a balance of efficiency and, and being able to adapt and flexibility. So I think that is also a consideration in these, um, in these responses. Okay, so stage four is the final stage. Um, so in this section, hospitals are asked to reflect on the information and analysis found in the prior sections and discuss their plans for sustainability as they consider delivering essential services to their community in this value-based world. And I'm on slide 22. I apologize for not um, continuing to provide guidance there. So um, stage four is really just a series of questions. Um, so I'll go through those now. Um, so given the financial headwinds facing rural hospitals, how um, can your institution balance the need to deliver care to rural patients who might be older, poorer, and less mobile than other patients with the need to ensure that services delivered um, in the community are delivered low cost and high quality? Um, and then please describe how hospitals will ensure delivery of high quality essential services to all members of its community at low price um, to all payers. And then please describe any current and future obstacles to sustainability and fully delivering cost effective high quality care um, in your community as envisioned in the optimized service line. Uh, additionally, hospitals are going to, uh, will be asked um, to offer possible solutions to those obstacles that can be undertaken by the hospital um, and then solutions that could be addressed by other stakeholders, policy bodies, um, et cetera. Um, and then how might payment reform mitigate um, some of these financial sustainability challenges, whether global budget, capitation, or some other payment reform mechanism. Um, and then we ask also for hospitals to describe their relationships with other care providers in the community as it relates to your work and investment in prevention and population health. Um, and what are the challenges and opportunities for improving how you work together to achieve better population health in your community? Um, so leveraging that value-based approach um, and thinking about how we can, can further that work. Um, and has the onset of COVID impacted service line decisions for both short and long term? Please describe any service investments or divestments related to your COVID experience. And then given existing financial and economic pressures uh, faced by hospitals and the goal of delivering high quality, low cost care, um, which assumes lean operations, as we mentioned before, how are you simultaneously planning for you know, another impending crisis? So either second wave of COVID, but also potential future pandemics. Um, what's the right, right balance here? And then, you know, provide a summary of your hospital's application for and receipt of funding related to the CARES Act and Coronavirus Relief Fund or other pandemic-related grants or loans to the extent that we don't already have that information. I think we can make clear what we have when this stage rolls out to alleviate administrative burden. Um, and then what assumptions on utilization expectations are you building into your budgets and forecasting? Have these methodologies changed with COVID-19? Uh, and then please attach any documents pertaining to strategic or sustainability planning that's already in place. Um, so this is a proposed timeline, um, and we recognize that this is a significant lift. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're certainly willing to work um, with stakeholders to figure out what the right cadence is. But, you know, I think the goal here, and as mentioned um, in the VAS letter, is to make sure that 
that this sustainability framework can influence um, the hospital budget process. And so um, March is approximately when um, hospital budget guidance really takes off for 2022. So I think any lessons that can be learned from this sustainability framework and then, um, you know, how we can leverage what we've learned from this um, exercise and kind of rolling it forward into that process um, would be immensely helpful. So we've, repo we've proposed, you know, if we issue the framework by August 31st, uh, we could implement stage one by October 31st, and, you know, then we have November 30th, December 30th, and January 31st for stage four. And, you know, recognizing certainly that COVID-19 is an additional layer, we don't know what this fall brings, um, but that this may need to be adjusted accordingly to, to those needs as well. So next steps for the sustainability framework, and I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list, um, you know, I think we could have a potential board vote today to expand sustainability planning to all hospitals, which is part of um, the VAS public comment from March. Um, I, I think we could open this up for a second public comment period um, until July 22nd um, to allow time for additional public comment um, to this latest version. Um, and then GMCB staff can continue working with stakeholders to finalize a timeline for this phased approach that makes sense given um, various needs, but recognizing kind of the critical nature of this work. Um, and then we could have a potential board vote on the framework and timeline um, on the 22nd. Um, and then GMCB staff will certainly continue identifying resources for hospitals to support this work. Um, the first time we were here talking about this framework, there was uh, grant funding offered through the Office of Rural Health. Um, and so I think it would make sense to circle back and see what other kinds of grants may be made available um, to help support this work. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned before, we hope to incorporate lessons learned from the sustainability planning into the hospital budget process um, and, you know, for 2022, certainly not this hospital budget process um, would be too quick. But, uh, and then, you know, hopefully we can implement an issue of the framework. Um, so I'll touch briefly on um, the regulatory integration piece. So um, the Vermont All-Payer model offers an opportunity for providers to receive stable and uh, stable funding stream in exchange for providing high quality value-based care, which we've been talking a lot about today through the sustainability planning. Um, and under the model, the ACO participates in a two-sided risk arrangement with CMS um, in exchange for the, these um, all-inclusive population-based payments. So they're fixed payments that are um, at this time reconciled against fee-for-service at year-end. Um, so this risk and the potential for shared savings and losses is then passed on to providers, mainly hospitals, um, to incentivize care delivery reform. And um, you know, with the eruption of COVID-19, this has exacerbated challenges to provider sustainability and the ability of certain providers to accept this risk and continue their participation in the model, um, much less join the model for the first time or join, you know, the Medicare uh, program if you're already participating in some other programs. And for this reason, um, GMCB staff have asked CMS whether they would be willing to contemplate a reduction to the risk corridor for FY21 so we can continue to build on this work. Um, so at the same time, providers, stakeholders, and legislators have voiced a desire to increase the opportunity for truly stable and predictable funding streams. So thinking about true capitation in the Medicare program, you know, thinking about global budgets and, and any other mechanism we can to provide opportunities for providers to access a more stable um, fund flow, particularly in, you know, in light of, of potential um, resurgence or new pandemics. Um, and, you know, we want to continue the state's investment in population health because we think that will make Vermonters healthier um, and have better lives. Um, you know, so I, the plan here would be for GMCB staff to engage with stakeholders and continue information gathering um, on providers' abilities to accommodate risk in 2021 and beyond. Um, and then kind of think about um, collectively what a hypothetical capitated model could look like or global budgets or whatever that is, but to think about those stable funding streams um, and, and try to understand what our um, provider needs are on that front. Um, and then I think staff would then come to the board and present findings on, on what we learned from those conversations. So I'll pause there for questions and public comments. Okay, first we'll open it up to the board for questions. I see a hand up, uh, Tom. Let me make sure my mic is on. Um, so uh, 
I don't have a, I mean, it's, it sounds like a very elaborate and thorough um, uh, process that you've laid out to take a, a really careful and thorough look at hospitals and hospital operations, et cetera. But there's a piece of me that also says, is there or should there be any overlap between this effort and the price variation study that the A-team is doing? Because you look at um, insurance with major payer. In 2019, it was $1.4 billion of money that came into the system. You know, and through the insurer, part of it to hospitals and part of it into hospital operating margins. And the over that a five year period, I mean, it's a statistic that still um, captures me in a way, is that 90% um, of all the operating margin um, among hospitals went to the UVM Medical Center. And so that raises a question to me, is that a rational outcome of the system or is it something else? Um, because the cost shift and payer mix uh, have a lot to do with sustainability. And so if we're just looking inside the walls of the hospital for efficiencies, then certainly I'm sure we'll find some, but we're not doing it in the context of a, a payer mix, which um, uh, clearly evidences some irrationality in it in terms of the smaller hospitals having negative operating margins and a substantial amount of the operating margin going to one entity. Um, and we have this price variation study that's kind of looking at, you know, where there might be inefficiencies in terms of services. Um, I just, uh, it's, it, the thought crosses my mind that um, maybe the scope of this over time, I mean, clearly you want to get through the hospital piece, but maybe the scope of this over time should take a look at the three major funding sources and how that money flows through the system. And is it doing it in a way where it's marrying up with the most efficient providers of the services um, at the provider level? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I recognize, yeah, so I think um, payer mix is certainly something that you will see throughout this framework. Um, but I mean, as you said, I think we need to kind of not put the cart before the horses and get through the hospital piece first. And then, you know, the board is certainly open to regulatory integration. I think, you know, the board just launched this white paper, but I imagine there will be follow-ons to that work as, as time goes on. So um, certainly an opportunity to write down. I've noted it. Thank you, Tom. Tom, just remember to remove your hand. Other questions from the board? Robin? Thank you, Elena. Um, it, I'm, I'm interested in um, seeing what kind of public comment we get today and, and coming back, uh, particularly around the timeline, because there is a lot going on. I like um, the idea of trying to work through how uh, the sustainability issues that even pre-COVID were threatening our hospitals um, could be incorporated into a next round of um, all pair model design, which um, seems still like that's very far away, but it's actually not, <laughs> uh, given that we uh, have some requirements in the decision, I mean, in the agreement to, uh, request a next round if we, if, as a state, chose to do so in the not too far future. So I like that aspect of it. Um, I do worry that, uh, I, I, I think the hard part for me to balance about this effort is that given the situation that we are in with COVID and the sustainability issues, time is of the essence, um, but this is also a, a tough time um, for hospitals to engage in a thoughtful outside of the box process, which is, I think what we're hoping they will do. I, I don't think what I'll speak for myself. Like I I'm hoping what we don't get back in response to this is what I would expect from, um, sort of, a in the box consulting exercise, 
such as, well, you should cut the low margin services and, you know, put more energy into elective surgeries because that's where you're making money, right? I think what we're hoping for is a process where hospitals are uh, thinking a little more outside the box in terms of con of really how do we creatively try to move forward with a sustainable model? And that necessarily is a harder exercise and requires more time. So I don't know what the timeline, I mean, we're really like stuck between a rock and a hard place on the timeline. So I don't know what the right answer is there, but I just thought I would express my view on that. Thank you. Jess? You're on mute, Jess. And we all do that. It's pathetic at this st stage in our in our careers of, of virtual meetings. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Patrick. Uh, you know, the presentation, Patrick, that you gave was really thorough and very eye-opening um, and appreciated it very much. And also, Elena, I appreciated your presentation very much and all the hard work that you and Patrick and Jeff have been doing on these planning exercises. Um, Pulling both presentations together, I would say the national statistics on rural hospital closures are, are pretty sobering, and the Vermont statistics on margins are also very troubling. And there were headwinds before uh, COVID, and obviously the recent pandemic only accentuated how vulnerable our healthcare system is, right? So, and I don't foresee it necessarily getting better. If our population continues to decline, and fixed costs are growing, largely because technology costs are growing, we're not gonna, this is not something we can just get out of quickly. Um, so I think this is a step forward. Again, I, I welcome and, and look forward to public comment. And I'm assuming that this is work that I would hope every hospital is already doing, um, particularly knowing that we're going into a value-based world and, and hospitals are gonna be accountable for cost and quality for the services that they offer. And that's beyond the state's healthcare reform. That's nationally driven Medicare reform efforts. So I think this is work that hopefully more or less hospitals are doing and, and having a consistent framework will provide us with a more holistic view uh, of the delivery system than the challenges to sustainability in this value-based world. So my hope is that, you know, I think the timeline we need to think about, but the more information that we have prior to March when we have to develop budgets for next year, will be really helpful because I think it would allow us to do more nuanced hospital budget guidance. I think now we have a kind of a blunt instrument and a one size fits all approach. If we have a better understanding of some of the challenges to sustainably delivering care, you know, high quality care at low cost, we may be able to develop a more nuanced budget guidance approach that reflects the challenges inherent in all of our communities. Um, and it would help us ensure that hospitals have adequate resources to deliver essential services as defined by the AHA. Uh, and that the other services that they're delivering are de being delivered at low cost and high quality, which they're gonna be accountable for in this value-based world. And again, also the timing is also important in the sense that we are trying to think about, you know, uh, refinements to the all-payer model and what could the next version look like, lessons that we've learned and to the extent that we want to include sustainability of our hospital system as a goal, I think we do, this will be more fodder for that conversation in our negotiations with the federal government. If we really want to think about, we want to keep our hospital sustainable, and these are some of the challenges they face. So on all of those fronts, I think this framework is really helpful, important. I think we can uh, you know, improve our decision-making, and it's important to know what hospitals can do. And also, I like the questions around what can other stakeholders do? Um, to help the sustainability. So, thank you. Okay, Maureen. Um, I just also want to thank the team for all the hard work that went into this. Um, I too am really going to refrain until till we get some public comment, but I'm just going to put out a, a couple things that um, may be of concern, which is you know, really the ability of the smaller hospitals to provide information on the margin, both on a contribution and on a fully loaded. Um, and, you know, one thing I'll point to is when we just looked through the hospital presentation where we saw a significant decline to budget on top line, um, expenses were, were right on to budget, you know, plus and minus, et cetera. But, but the point really showing 
how there is such a fixed base of costs. So when you start to allocate those to services, um, that, that can become difficult. So be interested, and also the consistency of what each of the hospitals will be able to deliver and will their process be the same, I think is gonna be you know, really important. And, and just something that, that Robin touched on briefly, but um, it, it's not like we want the, you know, as we said, like the surgeries to be, to be driving this. It's probably what would come out of this would be the opposite. However, if we look at the essential services, that may not be where hospitals are making money and they are making money on the other side, which keeps them afloat. So, you know, I, I think what's, What's, what needs to come together from this process is going to be, you know, what do we do with the information and, and how do we work it so that if, if hospitals are able to streamline their services and, and possibly services where they don't have enough to truly represent, um, you know, the numbers that we're looking at here, if they take those out, you know, how, how will they be offset? elsewhere and how we spread that. So I think there's something that definitely needs to be done. I think that, you know, we're seeing hospitals that, that are going out of business, um, but I'm not sure just getting this information, right, is gonna be the aha and the solution. We're gonna have to really be all working together, collaborative across the system. And I, and I think in some of the cases, we're asking the hospitals to come up with the solutions when they may not have the capabilities to do that. If we're saying cut a service and then say, find out where it can go, they might say like, how am I gonna do that? You know, I can't necessarily work out all the transportation and everything. But if we're working across the whole system to try to see where things should be done and, you know, in certain places and not in others, you know, we're gonna have to figure out how that works out. So uh, interesting to see what the comments we're gonna get, but, uh, but a lot of hard work and certainly something that we do need to make progress on. Yeah, thank you. So before we go to public comment, if the two board members could just lower their hands. Great, thank you. So at this point, we're gonna open it up to public comment. So Mike Fisher. It worked. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, um, Patrick and Elena, that uh, I agree. Uh, interesting presentation, great presentation. Um, my question is, uh, um, Kevin, I wonder whether Patrick would have a perspective on, th Patrick's presentation was, was before the 275 million more that's being distributed to providers. I, I understand that's going to more than hospital providers, but I would presume some of it's going to hospital providers. Um, and I wonder whether uh, uh, whether he would have some insights as to how that might play out on, on um, the presentation that he provided. And then also whether any of those monies uh, can reasonably be tracked to um, to reduce to to improve access for consumers. So unfortunately, Mike, um, the answers to both your questions are going to depend on what um, AHS does as they dole out the money, and um, so we're going to track it no matter what to make sure that. Um, in in the old Seinfeld episode, there's no double dipping, but mm -hmm. um, you know, it. I, I guess it's way too early for Patrick to uh, be able to answer the question because he just doesn't know how that pie is going to be doled out. Okay. But we will be following it intently, <laughs> and that's what's going to be tricky because. Um, these answers are going to come at the tail end of the uh, budget process. But I think uh, your comments about um, the benefits to consumers really should be directed to Secretary Smith, Mike. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mort Wasserman. Hi. Thanks. Those presentations were great. Uh, and forgive me if I if I sound like I'm 
pontificating, but I, I recall that, you know, two, two statements that strike me as very important. One is uh, Paul Batalden, quality improvement expert, once said that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it achieves. And this system, our whole hospital system and its primary care system and the supportive agencies is absolutely nuts. So, okay, let's just put that aside because I think most people recognize that there's room for improvement. The second is one of my mentors, Paul Young, used to say, kind of exaggerating it, that every hospital admission was a failure of primary care. Now, that was an overstatement because it's a failure of the social support systems as well. And, of course, some people need to be in the hospital. But putting that aside and hearing uh, in Elena's excellent presentation the nod to primary care, but it's a nod to primary care from the hospital systems, when, in fact, uh, a lot of the um, hospital systems aren't providing primary care and a lot of the hospital systems, some people, primary care people especially, would advocate that everybody would be better off if the hospital systems weren't the direct providers of primary care. So um, my comment is simply that there needs to be a very uh, stru structured process perhaps for engaging the primary care community. Uh, both those of, you know, uh, participating in the ACO, uh, but also those who ought to be attracted into participating in the ACO and engaging them and not relying on the hospital systems to engage the primary care uh, providers and uh, practices and clinics and FQHCs that happen to be providing the primary care within their service area. Thank you, Mark. Kevin, would you mind if I just uh, make a comment on Mort's comment? Because I think it raises a really interesting, challenging is issue for us in particular. Go ahead. All right. Um, thank you, Mort. I think that's an incredibly important point that you've made. Um, and, and I think it also highlights one of the challenges we have as a regulatory board engaging in this exercise from where we sit, which is uh, we don't regulate the vast majority of the healthcare system. We regulate hospitals and their associated providers. Um, and so ideally, I think if one were to engage in a resource allocation process across the state, one would want to do that on a health system basis as a whole. But we really, from where we sit, don't have the authority through our uh, legal legal authority really to do that so um i just wanted to react because i don't disagree at all with what you were saying but i think it is also a little bit above and beyond what we have the ability to do we can certainly you know we have a primary care advisory process we always welcome public comment from anyone um, regardless of whether it's within our, our authority or not but i think it's also important for us to be really clear what we have the legal ability to manage and do, because oftentimes uh, there's this expectation that the legislature has endowed us with sort of never ending authority and ability, which is just really not true. And so just for myself, I like to be very clear about where our authority stops and ends, just because I don't want to overpromise anyone uh, about what we're able to pull off. But thank you, that was a really important comment. So just to comment, to reply, I think in the short run, you're absolutely, the point is well taken. But in the long run, it needs to be fixed. So I can't believe that the Green Mountain Care Board doesn't have something to do with fixing this project, problem, problem excuse me, in terms of it, uh, advising the legislature, in terms of engaging the primary care community, um, advocacy of some sort. I realize you're not an advocacy organization, uh, but there's a kind of advocacy can, that can be done through education. And in fact, the, uh, the uh, process that Elena and Patrick have outlined is a form of education. So maybe that's be one of the results. Thanks. Thank you, Mort. Jeff Tiemann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
First, I, I want to begin by saying that, as we've said on numerous occasions before from the Hospital Association, that we agree on the need for sustainability planning. We've said that in formal correspondence with you and in conversations with the board publicly and, and in person. Um, and clearly we support the, the need and the effort to keep our hospitals strong and healthy and able to continue effectively serving their communities. Um, I, I think I'll just um, begin my remarks by um, sort of reacting to Elena a little bit. She, star she started by saying, this is a really big lift. I could not agree more. Um, and then she said, it's the right time and the right level of detail, and I could not disagree more. Um, unfortunately, this proposal and framework is poorly timed and extremely onerous. Um, it is an entirely new body of work um, that appears to have as a primary goal cutting the healthcare services that are available in our communities. Meanwhile, from a timing standpoint, um, it, it, it doesn't seem like we need to be reminded, but maybe we do, that we're still dealing with COVID in a very real and daily kind of way, not just messy and uncertain budgets, which we've heard a little bit about today, but also ongoing PPE and supply chain concerns, um, data reporting obligations to the state and the federal government, including a brand new one that was just added yesterday and involves a lot of effort, testing supply shortages, travel policy problems that lead to staffing challenges for our organizations, students coming back in the fall with uncertain results and the prediction that the winter wave of COVID is almost certain to be worse, and then a huge continued uncertainty around financials, medical services, supplies, and what the federal government is gonna do, just to name a few. So even if we were not in this environment, this proposed regulatory scheme represents, as we have said before, even before we knew what it looked like now, we said it represented enormous government overreach without clear benefit, and I continue to stand by that. What, what's been proposed and shared today is intricate and long and cumbersome. It amounts to an entire regulatory requirement in and of itself that rivals, if not exceeds, the budget process we already have in place. Last year, we discussed um, at length, we had two very long in-person meetings um, where feedback was allegedly collected to inform this process. In those meetings, we described, and also in corollary correspondence, that there are other ways at this sustainability conversation, including to assess hospitals' financial health using ratios, widely uh, accepted and objective measures that capture each organization's financial strength and stability, the same ratios that we know inform bond ratings and to reduce the administrative burden, as a couple of you said is important, by clarifying budget guidance questions to achieve the goals of sustainability planning. So in other words, we can do this within the process and structure that we already have. So it was just terribly disappointing that none of that input was heard or apparently included or reflected. And instead, we're now evaluating a framework that is not tenable or reasonable or productive. And I wanna clarify a couple things too that were said in the presentation. Elena said that Vaz supported doing this for all hospitals. That is flatly wrong. What I said and what Vaz has said on many occasions is that sustainability planning should involve all hospitals, but not this version of it. And it certainly was made to sound like we endorsed this complex framework as the way to do this. Not at all true. We said it should be part of the budget process. And it was said several times that we endorse this framework and we do not, as you can tell from my remarks. Um, it's also really disappointing and super challenging to receive this enormous complex framework last night um, and have uh, less than 24 hours to evaluate it before this important discussion. Um, in our view, th this exercise should be about making sure that hospitals have the financial resources and wherewithal and planning tools to stay strong and to serve their communities. The Green Mountain Care Board already has the tools in place to make this happen, and in fact, a structure and a process that enables it. We don't need a new regulatory process, which is what we're talking about now, in the state that already has the most onerous and elaborate regulation of hospitals in the entire country. Um, so our recommendation was to combine this with the budget process, um, which seems so much more logical than creating a parallel and overly burdensome regulatory scheme, which is what we're looking at. 
Um, I, just a couple last points, which is that in the COVID environment, our visibility is so limited. Look at the state. The state is not even doing a year-long budget because visibility is so limited. That is certainly true in the healthcare space, if not much more so. Sustainability should involve a dialogue on both cost and fair reimbursement, on a fair payment model that's attractive to providers, and on making sure that as we operate our businesses and serve our communities, our medical inflation and cost of maintaining vital infrastructure is managed appropriately. So what I would recommend given our reaction so far um, is that, that um, this whole entire process be put off until at least November, um, that we revisit it at that point and talk about what, might, what next steps might look like and what a different framework could look like. Um, and short of that, we will be providing additional specific comments on each of the components of this framework. Um, but as it stands, we um, object to it. And, um, and uh, we'll talk to you further about that as we move forward. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Mark Stanislaus. Hi, uh, Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. So, I mean, well, so, First of all, thank you for a very detailed presentation. I mean, it was clear to see the work, the effort, and the thought that we you know went into it. Um, and and you know, it's also appreciative that you're trying to find data from other so sources, well, to lower the burden um, on the hospitals as much as possible. But I just have to reiterate what Jeff said that this is a lot of work. And yes, I think there's value through this effort. But I think we just need to think about how we can go through mining that value in a different manner. And, you know, well, without getting into the specifics, I'm not even sure it's possible to provide all of this information that was shared. So, you know, those are some initial thoughts. I mean, I would throw out there if if we are really serious as a group on how how to go about financial sustainability planning and discussions in say an effective way with with the goal of finding solutions. I think one of, or find, finding shared solutions, one of the first steps is to do a capacity study, okay? Of what our population can support from services because I don't know how you get to financial sustainability without knowing we know what the appropriate we know footprint should be. We have 14 different hospitals in this state. Who knows if 14 are needed, okay? Because if 14 aren't needed, then the financial sustainability stuff, I mean, this is basic white paper stuff. Um, you know, where you need to start there to put that in comparison. And then, you know, I would just throw out if you know this is about finding solutions and when it comes to finding solutions you need to understand all of the drivers and put the full picture we you know together but um as the presentation as 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 i interpreted it okay you know you know this is what the hospitals can do for their financial sustainability but i would add there you know we need to put how the green mountain care board the commercial payers and the hospitals can partner together to find that pathway. It is really the coordination at a minimum of all three of those. And, you know, I am sure there's, you know, more. And as far as the current downward, we you know, trend, I think it was on slide seven. You know, I think it's important to have a sustainable system. You need to have commercial rate increases that fund inflation. And what we saw partly on that slide seven, where the hospitals own part of the responsibility to effectively manage expenses, part of that downward you know, trend was commercial rates applied to hospitals did not keep pace with inflation. And the compounding impact in future years of that is significant. And that's what I think we saw some of going into the pre-COVID poor financial performance. We can't undo that overnight, but we need to be willing to put those components on the table. And, you know, the best I can say is the University of Vermont Health Network meets three times a year with three rating agencies, three different ones that specialize in healthcare, speak to hospitals 
all across the nation. And if there isn't a better gauge to understand what financial sustainability is taking a look at, at, at those rating reports, and they even call out the lack of commercial rate increases also. Okay, and then, then I don't think we can overlook the burden that the cost shift has put on hospitals over this time period that has also added to that downward we know margin trend. So, you know, if this is about finding solutions and a pathway forward, you know, we need to be willing to put those discussion comments on the table at the right time. And like I said, I can't reiterate enough what, you know, what Jeff said, you know, this seems like it's meaningful work if we go about it in the right way. But, you know, you know, well, we're closing budgets, we're figuring out how to bring employees back, you know, back to work, you know, um, you know, what we're being told is that there could be another wave of COVID in the fall, early winter. So, you know, um, you know, um, keep in mind that it does make sense to make progress on this too. So, you know, we just need to balance that together. I mean, so thank you for this opportunity with to share my comments. Thank you, Mark. Jeff, do you have another comment or you just didn't take your hand down? Uh, no, sir, I, I'm not used to Microsoft, whatever I, this is, so I didn't know how to do that. Thank you, sorry. You just have to click on that hand, yep. that's Got all. Got it. We're, we're all struggling to uh, get used to uh, ever-changing technologies. Is there other public comment? Yes, hi, Kevin, this is uh, Kathy Mahoney. Um, in, in listening to all of the speakers on this issue, first of all, I agree with thanking everybody for the presentations, both of them. There's obviously an awful lot of detailed work that went into them, and um, I appreciate that. Um, the The second presentation is, was really comprehensive, and um, as I listened to it, I was my reaction to it was that it, it sounds like a, a plan – under ideal circumstances. And um, it all makes sense. And the questions need to be answered um, in order to get us where we need to be. But I don't know that we're there at this point that we could actually um, follow such detail. So then I began to think more about it as really a change management question, because I think what everybody is really trying to get to is where do we need to be in the end to have sustainable health care and affordable safe health care in Vermont. Um, and I am, you know, relatively new to the to the group here. And so I forgive me please if I ask the question to which there perhaps is already an answer. But when I go back to change management philosophy, I think of assessment. Uh, how do we decide where we are, sort of our present state of affairs? And some of the questions ask those kinds of questions. Do we have the capacity at all the different hospitals uh, that we think we have? Do we have the financial people with the financial chops, people with the reporting skills? Do we have people who can collect the data? All of those things are necessary to make the actions outlined in this comprehensive plan uh, possible. And I, I just don't know if every hospital does. I think I have a better handle on whether private practices and private practitioners do, because uh, that's a hat I used to wear. And I, it, it strikes me as unlikely that the majority of smaller groups and smaller practices would be able to contribute quality information to, to the conversation around assessment. So I'm really not sure that we're, we're there enough, and perhaps the focus should be on following maybe a change management principle of a formal assessment. The other question I have, or the other concern I have about this, is that when we do change management, one of the things that is very important, and I think somebody said this, or it might have been Jess, is that we have a we need to have a standard set of questions and vet that process so that we're sure that the data and the information or the answers we get to these questions from hospital A, hospital B, practice X, practice Y, 
actually are consistent across the board. Otherwise, the data that we get to make these important decisions about sustainability, the data won't be very valid. Um, so I, I, I think that it seems a little early, and I, I also am concerned about the, the impact of doing this right now with COVID because so many facilities are short on simply administrative staff. Uh, many administrative support staff, secretaries have been furloughed. Many nurses and many other quality data folks have been furloughed and were behind on reports. Uh, so I, I just have a hard time of imagining how we'd actually pull this off. Thank you, Kathy. Other public comment? So um, not hearing any, I just want to state that um, given the uh, feedback that we received to date, it's unlikely that there'll be a vote today. <laughs> and um, I think it's important that um, we work constructively with uh, the stakeholders to uh, make sure that the timeline works for everyone. Um, so Jeff, what I would be asking you for is some real meaningful feedback of what can be done and under what timelines. And um, we'll come back to this topic again next week. Um, but if you could get that to us um, before next week, that would be much better so that we can plan accordingly. Is that okay, Jeff? Yes, I will plan to do that, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Robin. Kevin, can I just ask a question? Uh, I didn't think we had a Wednesday board meeting next week because of the rate hearings. Oh, you might be right. I mean, there's nothing on my calendar. I yep. No, no board meeting next Wednesday. Um, we certainly can take anything up after the rate review hearings. They're long days. And we also have the public forum where we'll all be together. Um, but we may want to, um, you know, we can get the feedback and then maybe the next week talk about it, Kevin. Yeah, I don't think there's any any uh, real problem with waiting till the 29th. Thanks. I don't either. I just wanted. To, I just. I just wanted to, you know, bring it up since we had been saying acting as though we might be acting <laughs> on something on the yep. 22nd, and it gives a little more time. Yeah. Is that okay with the, the full board? People could just nod or shake? Yes, and I also think it gives Boss more time to prepare something about what they'll be able to do. Thank um, you, Morgan. You're welcome, Jeff. <laughs> okay. So with that, we're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is a legislative update. And I'm gonna turn it over to Christina and Jean whenever you're ready. I will share my screen, so just give me one second. Okay, can everyone see that? We can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, Christina McLaughlin, Health Policy Analyst with Green Mountain Care Board, um, and this will be hopefully a brief presentation, um, just providing an overview of the last um, handful of months of the legislative session. Um, and then I will turn it over to Jean Stetter, our Administrative Services Director, to review the Green Mountain Care Board budget. So first and foremost, there were a few big bills signed by the governor, um, a couple fairly recently. Um, the bills um, listed here were signed between the end of March and early July of 2020, and they include Act 91, an act relating to Vermont's response to COVID-19, Act 136, an act relating to health care and human services related appropriations from the Coronavirus Relief Fund, and Act 140, an act relating to miscellaneous health care provisions. So I want to just provide an overview for Act 91. Um, 
The act provides administrative and provider flexibility, including uh, the bullets listed below, um, which include increases flexibility for AHS to address COVID-19. It allows the Green Mountain Care Board to waive or permit variances from laws, guidance, and standards related to hospital budget CON, health insurance rate review, and ACO budget review for up to six months after the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, it directs DFR to consider adopting emergency rules to expand health insurance coverage and to waive or limit cost sharing requirements and expand patient access to and provider reimbursement for health care services delivered through telehealth, audio only, and other telecommunication services. Offers changes to prescription drug coverage requirements and increases health care professional licensing flexibility and expands telehealth insurance coverage. So the board um, is mentioned in Section 5 of Act 91. Um, essentially, the board is allowed to waive or permit variances from state laws, guidance, and standards with respect to the regulatory activities listed to the extent permitted under federal law to prioritize and maximize direct patient care, safeguard stability of providers, and allow for orderly regulatory processes that are responsive to needs related to COVID-19. Um, the board has implemented Act 91 in many ways, and to name a few, the board has closely monitored hospital financial health and is, as we saw today, continuing internal development of the hospital sus sustainability planning, um, streamlined CON processes for new healthcare projects that support the state's ability to respond to COVID. Uh, requested flexibility and additional funded to be directed to providers for Vermont COVID that relates to our all payer model. Um, and in regard to the ACO, uh, adjusted budget orders in response to COVID-19. There are many, many more, but I just, for the sake of time, I didn't wanna list off too many. So um, moving to Act 136, um, the uh, Act contains a total of $326 million allocated to healthcare and human services. Um, and just a high-level overview, $275 million of that money is, is uh, allocated to grants for eligible healthcare providers, including hospitals, independent doctors, mental health providers, dentists, rural health clinics, FQHCs, labs. The remaining funds um, are for child care, food assistance, and other services. Uh, Act 140, um, I'll switch to that now. Um, a quick overview is uh, the Act addresses mental health, hospital budget review, um, expansion of VFARM coverage, and the review and modification of prior authorization requirements. Um, there are many sections of Act 140 that directly relate to the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm going to outline those in the next um, slides. So Section 1 of Act 140 um, is amended to direct the board to collect and review data from each community hospital. Um, sorry each community mental health and developmental disability agency de designated by the commissioner of mental health or, or of disabilities aging and independent living which may include scope of service volume utilization discharges payer mix quality coordination and other aspects of the health care system and financial condition including solvency the green mountain care board um, is required to have processes appropriate to the designated and specialized service ag agency scale and their role in Vermont's healthcare system. And they must consider ways in which the psychiatric hospitals can be integrated into system-wide payment and delivery system reform. So moving on to section three of Act 140, uh, which pertains to Brattleboro Retreat. Um, it directs that any hospital whose budget newly comes under the board's review as a result of the amendments to 18 VSA section 9451 made by section two, the board may increase the scope of the budget review process for the hospital gradually, provided the board conducts a full review of the hospital's proposed budget no later than the budget for FY 2024. In developing its processes for trans transitioning to a full review, the board shall collaborate with the hospital and AHS to prevent duplication of efforts 
reporting requirements. The board and AHS shall determine which documents submitted by the hospital to AHS are appropriate to share with the board. In determining whether and to what extent to exercise discretion, the board must consider existing fiscal oversight of the hospital by AHS and fiscal pressures on the hospital as a result of COVID-19. Moving on to slide nine, uh, Act 140 um, has a lot of uh, language relating to prior authorization and to be starting off in section eight, um, 18 VSA, Section 9418B is amended to uh, require health plans to annually review the list of medical procedures and medical tests for which it requires prior auth, at least annually, and shall determine the prior authorization requirement for those procedures and tests for which a requirement is no longer justified or for which requests are routinely approved with frequency as to demonstrate the prior auth does not promote health care quality or reduce spending to a degree sufficient to justify the administrative costs to the plan. And it is amended to attest to the DFR and non care board annually or on annually or before September 15th that it has completed the review and appropriate elimination of prior auth requirements as required by the subdivision one above. So again, more prior off in section nine of Act 140. It also relates to electronic health records. DFR is required in, to consult with the health insurance and healthcare provider associations to report opportunities to increase the use of real-time decision support tools embedded in EHRs to complete prior authorization requests for imaging and pharmacy ser services, including options that minimize costs for healthcare providers and insurers. This, the report is due on or before January 15th, 2022 to the Green Mound Care Board and the committees that are listed below. So again, more prior authorization, and this relates to the all-payer model. The board in consultation with DIVA uh, certified ACOs, uh, payers participating in the all-payer ACO model Healthcare providers and other interested stakeholders shall evaluate opportunities for and obstacles to aligning and reducing prior authorization requirements under the all payer ACO model as incentive to increase scale and opportunities to waive additional Medicare administrative requirements in the future. Uh, there is a report due on or before January 15, 2022, and the board shall submit the results of its evaluation to the healthcare committees. So Act 140, Section 11 touches on uh, prior authorization and gold carding. Uh, on or before January 15th, 2022, the health insurers with more than 1,000 covered lives in Vermont for major medical shall implement a pilot program that automatically exempts from or streamlines certain prior auth requirements for a subset of participating healthcare providers which include primary care providers. The insurer shall make available electronically, including on a publicly available website, details about its prior auth exemption or streamlining program, including criteria that is outlined in section 11. I did not include the criteria. It was a long list um, just to save space and time. Uh, the report um, is due on or before January 15th, 2023. And each insurer is required to implement a pilot program shall report to the House Committee on Healthcare and Senate Committees on Health and Welfare and Finance and to the Green Mountain Care Board. And they must include the four items that are listed below. So prior auth and provider exemptions, Section 12 of Act 140 um, states that on or before December 30th, 2021, DIVA shall provide findings and recommendations to the board House Committee on Healthcare, Senate Committees on Health and Welfare, and on Finance regarding clinical prior auth requirements in the Vermont Medicaid program, including one, a description and evaluation of outcomes of the prior auth waiver pilot program for Medicaid beneficiaries submitted to the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO model. Service of which Vermont Medicaid requires prior auth um, included denial rate for prior auth requests and the potential harm in absence of prior auth requirements 
based on the information pursuant to subdivision A of the subdivision two, the services for which the department would consider waiving the prior author requirement and exempting from prior authorization requirements whose healthcare professionals uh, whose prior off those healthcare professionals whose prior authorization requests are routinely granted. Um, and so, going continuing with uh, provider exemptions, the results of the department's current efforts to engage with healthcare providers and Medicaid beneficiaries to determine the burdens and consequences of the Medicaid prior authorization requirements and those providers and beneficiaries' recommendations for modification modifications to those requirements. The potential to implement systems that would streamline prior off processes for the services for which it would be appropriate with a focus on reducing the burdens on providers, patients, and the department for, for which the state and federal approvals would be needed in order to make proposed changes to the Medicaid prior off requirements. And finally, five, the potential for aligning prior off requirements across payers. Uh, Act 140 also includes um, extensions relating to Act 91. Uh, Act 91 extends several, uh, I'm sorry, 140 uh, extends several positions in Act 91 beyond March 31st, 2020, including the following teams out of state licensed healthcare professionals license in Vermont, waive certain telehealth requirements during the state of emergency, allows retired healthcare professionals to practice under specific requirements. And Act 140 also allows the Department of Financial Regulation, Emergency Rules, Rulemaking, and its extensions to 30, 2021. I will move to the bills that the board um, has some interest in, and we are, we're following COVID-19. Obviously, uh, given the pandemic, everything else was sort of put on pause to focus on um, COVID-19 uh, legislation. Um, so I, I'll just quickly read through these bills that uh, we believe will be taken up in August when they um, come back to um, session. Um, and uh, then I will turn over to Jean. So one of the big pending house bills um, is H607, an act relating to increasing the supply of primary care providers in Vermont. Uh, as noted at the bottom, this is passed in the house and is now referred to Senate Health and Welfare. Uh, in the current version, the, the bill would direct the health care, the director of health care reform um, to maintain a current health care workforce development strategic plan with the help of an advisory group to continue efforts to ensure that Vermont has the health care workforce necessary to provide care to all Vermont residents. A draft of the plan must be submitted for review and approval to the board by December 1st, 2020, and the board shall review and approve the plan within 30 days. On or before January 15, 2021, the director will provide the workforce strategic plan to the legislature. So also directs Eva um, to collaborate with the Office of Primary Care and Area Health Education Centers at UVM College of Medicine to establish rural primary care position scholarship program and appropriates money to the Vermont Department of Health to additional scholarships for nursing students through the Healthcare Educational Loan Repayment Fund. Another big bill is H795, an act relating to increasing hospital price transparency. Um, this also has passed in the House and the bill is now um, committed to the Committee on Health and Welfare. Uh, it would direct um, the board on or before February 1st, 2021 to report its progress um, to healthcare committees and Senate finance in developing and implementing a public interactive web-based price transparency dashboard for use by healthcare consumers, including the results of the board's efforts to validate BCURES data for the comparison with hospital discharge data and with information from health insurance. The board shall develop and maintain a public dashboard that allows consumers to compare health care prices for certain services across the state. The dashboard shall be accessible on the statewide comparative hospital quality report published by the Commissioner of Health. The board is required to update the information at least annually and on or before February 1st, 2022. The, the board shall provide a demonstration of the dashboard to the House Committee on Health Care and Senate Committees on Health and Welfare and Finance. Uh, this bill will most likely be taken up in August. Um, but 
So who knows if dates will change, um, but we shall see. Moving on to Senate bills that are pending, um, starting with S202, an act relating to limiting the co-payment amount for chiropractic services and certain health insurance plans. This would obviously limit copay amount for Cairo services in silver and bronze level qualified and reflective health benefit plans to no more than 125% of the amount of the copay applicable to care and services provided by a care provider under the same plan. Currently, this bill is sitting in Senate Welfare, is referred to them by Senate Finance. Um, S245, an act relating to eliminating cost sharing requirements for primary care. Uh, this would just have no cost sharing for preventative and primary care services. This is still very much an as introduced uh, version um, and is currently in the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, S290, an act relating to health care reform implementation. Uh, this is quite a big bill. Um, it would create additional reporting, certification, and budget requirements for ACOs direct hospitals to report certain rate increases to the board, impose new requirements on contracting between health plans and providers, and the board's membership uh, must conclude, uh, include a healthcare professional, require the board to begin exercising its rate setting authority and establish site neutral reimbursement amounts and direct the board to review and approve contracts between health plans and providers. The bill would also impose limits on health insurance rate increases attributable to administrative expenses and require the Agency of Human Services to report on two-year ACO budget and reporting cycles and on the likely effects of attributing or not attributing state employees to, and public school employees to ACO. Uh, this bill is still sitting in Senate Health and Welfare. Um, as of March 9th, there is a draft 1.1. Um, uh, the board, along with a long list of other uh, folks, have provided testimony and recommended changes to this bill pre-COVID. This will most likely be taken up again um, when they meet back up. Um, but it, I would, I kind of assume it will change form at least one more time, just because it, it is a big bill and uh, there has been a lot of testimony on it. Two more uh, pending Senate bills includes uh, S-296, an act relating to limiting out-of-pocket expenses for prescription insulin prices. This would limit the beneficiary's total out-of-pocket responsibility for insulin medication to not more than $100 per day supply. This is passed in the Senate and has been referred to the House Committee on Health Care. So this will likely also be taken up in August. Um, S309, an act relating to limitations on health care contract provisions and surprise medical bills. And this would certain provisions and contracts between health insurers and health care providers and limit out of network providers at in network facilities. So that is the high level overview of the legislative um, bills. Uh, so I will turn it over to Jean unless. We want to pause now um, for questions, but Jean only has a couple of slides, so if she's ready to present, I'll just pass it over to her. Yeah, we'll take the uh, questions afterwards. Okay, sounds good. Jean, are you on? I am. I am on. Thank you very much, Christina, for doing that. Um, so what I wanted to highlight is that, as you all know, we're in an unusual place this year. Um, it's atypical for the state not to have an approved budget for the fiscal year that we're in. We do have an approved budget for the first quarter of fiscal year 21, and that is a straight 25% of um, the the budget that had been submitted. So so we do have spending authority. All the agencies in the state have spending authority for that um, based on a straight 25% um, allocation. But what we're working on now and we're working to submit is a FY21 restatement budget. So what that looks like is They've currently given um, agencies and the departments a goal of a 5% general fund cut. And, um, and so um, we are working on preparing that now. 
it could be that what the governor submits to the legislature, the legislature comes back on August 25th, he plans to submit his official budget to them about a week prior to that. It could be that the numbers will change. We won't get our final targets until then. Um, but that's what we're currently working under. And you can see that indicated in our total appropriation chart there. Now, um, Christina, if you'd be willing to change to the next slide. What that shows is um, for the Green Mountain Care Board, because our funds are comprised of general fund and bill back fund at 4060, if we, you can see that if we um, have a 5% cut reduction in our general fund, we will have a corresponding 5% reduction in our bill back fund. So that just shows how it um, translates across um, because of the statutory 40-60 split. So that's, that's what I have. We don't have final numbers, but we're working towards it and the legislature will be back um, on or around August 25th to um, take it up. Okay, well, thank you. We'll start with questions. Well, you two must have done a good job because I'm not seeing any questions. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Is there any public comment? Again, I don't I don't hear anything. The only thing I hear is either somebody doing the dishes or taking apart or putting together a piece of something. But um, that's been throughout the last hour or so. Um, so um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.